Hello? Okay. All right. Uh, my name is Harish uh, Bhagavatla. Of course, my last name is a little difficult to pronounce. Don't worry about that. You can call me Harish. Uh, so, uh, I've been here uh, last year as well, giving a presentation on uh, some of my experience, like with respect to how I worked as a product manager for last 10, 12 years at various organizations, uh, how I worked with, you know, different groups, different departments within the uh, organizations like sales department and marketing, development and QA and other people. Uh, well, it's going back again somewhere. Oh, I think is that me who's doing it? I think I'm doing it. There we go. Sorry. So uh, just to give you uh, about my background, um, I've been in the software industry for close to 20 years now, uh, but in the product management more than 12, 13 years now. Um, I started as a software engineer, so I used to do uh, hands-on programming uh, at Oracle a while back. Um, and then at some point of time in 2004, I thought of you know, moving into product management. Uh, the only reason I moved was uh, into product management was it was cool because I want to talk to customers. Uh, and I was not getting a chance as a developer to talk to the customers. So I thought maybe that is the best way to kind of do that. So I approached my manager, I approached other people within the department, and I started slowly taking up the uh, opportunities, like you know, trying to go talk to customers, try to grab some requirements and other stuff. And then uh, some point of time in 2005, I was kind of doing the product management, but Back then, uh, companies like Oracle, they had a product management department, it was, but it was not completely equipped with you know, product management philosophies. I'll kind of talk about that as well a little bit. Um, I mean, you will see a lot of difference compared to 2005 to 2018. There's a vast difference you know, with respect to how you approach product, product management, UX, and other stuff. So at that time, it was not that great. So what I felt was maybe I should just go out, uh, work for smaller companies. Uh, so I got in touch with someone at a company called Skyer. Uh, they offered me a job as a product manager. So I was one of their first product managers over there. Uh, they already had a product, but it was all built by a group of engineers and some market, you know, uh, marketing people and industry experts. But there was no formal product management department. So when I joined, I joined as the head of the product management there and then grew the team uh, over like a few years uh, where in 2012 it got acquired by Oracle. So the fun fact is that I started with Oracle, came out of Oracle, went back to Oracle and finally in 2017 I quit Oracle because I wanted to go back and do more outside and you know start my own stuff. So I am kind of working with a uh, consulting company right now we are partners with Oracle. Uh, they actually, we actually go and implement the same product that I developed or designed back in 2006 to 2012 at Skyer. We implement that product, but we are also trying to expand and offer more products around that and branch out and build new products in the same area that we have done for a long time. Uh, and this area that we concentrate, or at least I concentrate, is developing the uh, project management software for construction industry. So especially managing all the uh, construction, make capital constructions. Like if you are uh, talking about uh, San Jose Airport or Intel fabrication plants or big oil and gas facilities, then they use this software to actually manage all aspects of the product, right? project, like cost and budgeting and uh, schedules and things like that. So uh, my expertise is in that area, developing the products for that. Uh, so right now we are in the initial stage of developing the product um, as a product manager, as a uh, one of the uh, kind of, I won't call myself as a co-founder yet because the company is still forming. Uh, but uh, the idea is to actually come uh, go out and uh, develop new products which will bridge the gap between the technology and the actual customer needs in the construction world. Uh, so we are trying to work with uh, the latest things like IoT, chatbots and other stuff so that we can fill that gap uh, with respect to what they need in the back office and what is happening on the field side from a construction point of view. So that's the primary focus for us right now. Okay. So that's my background. Um, 
again, been there for a product manager for almost like 12, 13 years now. Uh, worked with various groups, various departments. Uh, at uh, Oracle, when it got, uh, when they acquired Skyr, um, I moved into what we call as a product strategy group within Oracle. This was more like outbound, trying to figure out like you know, where the product should go. Uh, so uh, when I did the initial product in Skyr for eight, nine years, uh, when I moved into Oracle, they gave me an opportunity to actually build a new product from ground up. Uh, uh, that is because Oracle has bought a, uh, five to six companies over a period of time. We all know that Oracle buys a lot of companies. And this department, they also spend a lot of dollars to actually buy uh, six or seven companies over a period of time. So my job as a product strategy lead was to actually uh, combine all these products from a IP point of view, not from the technology point of view, but from IP point of view, and build a new brand new platform where that can go as a single point solution uh, that can replace all these other products. That was my goal, uh, my uh, responsibility. But of course, uh, a lot of things happened, so I had to leave Oracle and then start my own stuff. So that is my background. Um, I think uh, the idea today is like, uh, it's completely open. You can ask me any question. Of course, if it is uh, something that I can answer, I'll definitely try to answer. Um, so yeah, I think we'll open it up. We have a second mic, so we're trying to get in between those of you. If anybody's got questions, we can start off. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Yeah. Now, I know Oracle, like other Google and Microsoft and other, it's also the ocean. So, within Oracle, yeah, so this was on the application side. So when I say application, people typically think that it is Oracle eBiz e or you know ERP applications. Uh, Oracle also has other branches. So uh, it's called a global business unit. So I was part of one of the global business unit, and right now it is called CGBU, Construction and Engineering Constru Business Unit. So this is similar to utilities and other. Uh, global business units. So I was part of that. Okay, I understand that. Uh, I am also in PBS, so okay. I think what we are talking about that when they have the application for the utilities, specifically for the utilities vertical. Yes, so we are building something for construction vertical. Or rather, we used to, I used to be part of that before. Uh, so my question is, you, uh, you also came uh, from a software engineer background, moved into a uh, product man uh, management role. You know, but again, that was back in 2005. Things have changed a lot since then. Uh, most of the companies that I've uh, looked at right now, I, I'm from a software engineer background. Most of the companies that have the product manager roles require people. You know, they, everybody wants people to come in up and running. You know, you just come into the uh, company and you know, just take the product all the way over there. So what is the best strategy to you know, go through that transition if the opportunities are limited or not available within your own company? So if I understand your question correctly, uh, how do you jump into the product management role within the company coming from the software side? No, outside the company, like not within the company. Okay, outside, 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 outside the company, company. yeah. yeah. If there are opportunities within the company, obviously that's the best approach because you already know the product, you work on the product as a software engineer, but if you're looking at uh, opportunities outside the company, then how do you approach that? Yeah, so uh, the interesting thing about that is um, the way things are being uh, perceived right now in the market, especially from the product management point of view, I'll kind of compare it with a uh, little bit of software side. I won't say it is good and bad, but uh, that's how things are going in that direction, and there's not much we can do. What's happening is that if you go back to uh, at least my software engineering experience, I'll talk about it, and I'm pretty sure it's the same thing right now. If you try to go and apply for a job, they'll ask you, do you know Java? Do you know C++ or C Sharp or whatever that might be, the latest technologies, right? And uh, they expect the person who's coming on board understands that knowledge, understands that coding or whatever that might be. Unfortunately, in product management as well, people are actually getting into that. In my personal opinion, and with you know, 
I have hired so many product managers in my career, last 12, 13 years. And I have never seen uh, where, or at least I did not go after someone asking, okay, do you have the construction background or project management for construction project software? Uh, then I'll hire you. I never saw that. For me, product manager is a person who can bridge that gap. That's the purpose of a product manager. But unfortunately, if you go to the market right now and if you try to apply for any job in product management, they'll say, oh, do you have three years of experience in this field? Like, if I already have experience, uh, I mean, it's hard, right? You know, there are certain companies that are like very uh, new to this field, right? Uh, they cannot expect that you have all the knowledge. But unfortunately, again, that, that's a market. So, uh, but we cannot do much. I think we have to highlight that we have the product management experience, which means that you will be able to uh, bring that experience where you can understand the customer requirements. And not just from a, uh, how do you translate the requirement into nice PowerPoint and design documents and other stuff truly understand how can you lay down the foundation for the product. Since you are coming from a software engineer, you will have a lot more experience out of that. Think about that, how do you break down your code, right? Try to put that in that into your product management perspective as well. Uh, of course, getting that first call to get into the interview itself is a hard part, but if you manage to get that through referrals or whatever that might be, make sure that when you go there, you highlight how you kind of uh, design the software, not from coding point of view, but feature functions point of view. So if you have that mindset, you will have a better chance to actually get the job or transition into product management. Uh, again, I'll, I'll give you a simple example here. Uh, I have hired people or I have seen people who moved into product management where they have come from uh, support organization, quality assurance, sales, and as a matter of fact, people who actually uh, are on the customer side, we have seen people who are like experts in their, like, you know, let's say in my case, it was construction side. They know how things work on in the field and they were very interested in coming over onto the product management side because they wanted to actually build software. So, um, in my opinion, there is no hard set of rules that you have to have this as a product manager. As long as you will be able, you are first a good listener because you have to listen to the requirements and understand what those things are. And also, since you are playing a key role, and we are all trying to be product managers here, uh, no offense to software engineers or QA or salespeople or anyone else. If you are joining a product company, that is the bread and butter of the company. So that means you are at the center. It doesn't matter who is there. Of course, there's a CEO and everyone else. They all run their own stuff. But since it's a product company, you are the center of that, right? So you got to have that uh, patience, listening capabilities so that you are talking to every single person uh, and dealing with them day in, day out. So people skill is one of the key things for a product manager. Apart from if they are requesting like, you know, any other uh, tools. I mean, there is no tool set that you need to really go through to actually be a product manager, right? It's not like you're learning a Java code or you're trying to be, uh, uh, know some kind of a QA testing tool or did you sell it to 100 people before? It's not like that. It is about how can you analyze the requirements, how can you lay down the foundation of this uh, product so that uh, you can add more features to that, more functionality to that. So that would be the key thing for a product manager, right? Listening, being patient about it, and uh, understanding the requirements, translating them, uh, be able to think out of the box, right, also, right? Um, if I have a problem, how do I kind of come out with various solutions? Hi, my, my name is Nate, and I come from the construction industry. All right, and we are a family then. 
and then project management, and I want to get in better context. So, is your company structured in agile or something similar to that, where you're interfacing with the customer and then providing the stories to the team members, or can you explain how you actually are structured? Yeah. So. Um with the current company, we are structured in weird way. We are like doing everything. It's like extreme stuff. Uh, but in past, at Oracle and at Skyr, uh, it was all agile. So uh, in the beginning, of, when I joined Skyr, it was all like waterfall. We had like a long process, six months, eight months to actually uh, develop all the requirements. This is back in 2006. And then some point of time, I think 2008 or 2009, we moved over into agile. So that's when we kind of jumped into more uh, sprints and every two weeks, you know, development cycle. Of course, we started with uh, three month cycle, then we got it down to two months and then one month so that we can release something every month. So for that, we had to adopt like agile and then every two months, uh, every two weeks, we had to have like a uh, sprint reviews and other stuff. And at the Oracle as well, uh, we actually adopted the same uh, processes Though it was a new product, we tried to implement the same HL processes. Uh, it kind of worked uh, to some extent. Uh, I was not too happy about it because it was a new product. There is nothing to show like every two weeks, but it was okay. Like you know. But to answer your question, yes, Agile was one of the uh, process that we followed. And we had our own version. You, know, you read a book, people prescribe that you have to follow these things for Agile. But every company has its own variation of that because of cultural thing and you know, how people have come together. And what are some of your roles with that? Uh, so uh, at Skyr, I, um, I was a uh, product uh, manage, uh, product, director of product management there. Uh, beginning it was all waterfall model, but when we moved into more uh, agile model, I was playing a role of chief product owner. So I was responsible for all the product managers who were reporting to me. Uh, but they were all the product owners. So my job was uh, every week sit with them, talk about the product designs and everything, and they will go back to the respective Scrum teams and they'll be talking to them. Uh, of course, uh, then moving into uh, Oracle, it was more a product strategy side. So we had other groups uh, which were dealing with the daily Scrums and everything. So that was my role. And once in a while, if people are out of on vacation or we were short of uh, people from resource point of view. I used to play the product owner role as well. So I had to sit with the teams. Uh, we had a couple of QA people, three or four developers, and a scrum master. So I, I was playing the product owner. So I was sitting with them every day as part of the daily scrum, go through the backlogs, uh, try to give the points to each story po uh, stories, update those story points, relevant, uh, relevant numbers, and also doing all the... Uh, uh, storyboards and other stuff, the points, systems, and everything, moving over all the tasks that are done. So that was part of the daily process. And that is still a process that goes on at Oracle or any other company, because that is, it's a proven method that people have adopted right now, which works pretty good, especially when we're talking about cloud products. And uh, so myself, I'm working as a software engineer at Magnetic. So my question is, if somebody wishes to transition from software engineering to EM role, so what are some of the transferable skills? Can you talk about that? Um, definitely, from an engineering point of view, right? Because you know how to uh, keep the coding aspect of it outside. Because if you transfer into a product manager, uh, depending on the team that you are working with, they won't like you to talk to them about the code. And they'll never like you that because they will never encourage you to do that because it's their job. Your job is to tell them what to develop or from a product point of view. So first thing is not to do that, right? Other transferable stuff uh, uh, from a uh, thinking process point of view, right? How do you write your code, right? You are going to write some kind of a architectural, you're going to start writing with some kind of architectural diagrams, right? Okay, my code, if I am trying to do this, uh, whatever that might be, right? I'm going to modularize that code in a certain way. Okay, this piece of code is going to be reusable, so I'm going to do it, uh, write it one way, and then everything else is going to be in a certain way, right? So you're going to think about that from a code perspective. That kind of thinking, you should definitely bring that into the product management. 
because that will give you how to think about a future right because at the end of the day if you are trying to develop a future uh, in this day and age people are not going to develop a product for uh, yes you know if it's a startup and you know things like that if they have a lot of money they might develop for one year but that's unheard right now you want to have a product coming out in a two months right or features coming out in two months but you have a long list of things that you need to do right you now um, like, let's say you have requirements for next one year or one and a half year how do you break it down into that two month cycle or one month cycle or one week cycle right so with your knowledge about software development if you translate that how do you write that code into the product management where you can modernize all those things that will be a big help that will be a great help for you i would suggest that for software people software engineers who are coming into product management and also people who are coming let's say from qa side also because it's the same concept right qa also they are actually testing piece by piece how do you translate that thinking process into designing the product right so that will help you a lot when th that helped me a lot when i moved from software engineering into soft, uh, product management so that would be a good uh, definitely thing that you can transfer other stuff of course as a software engineer uh, we feel that we can do everything uh, because we know how to write a code and everything things like that but when you move into the product manager your responsibility will be quite different because when you put the product forward unless the company doesn't have a support organization or a product management organization they'll go to the software engineer customers will come to software engineers but if you are a product company the first thing that they will do is come and knock on the door of a product manager and you should be aware of the product you should be aware of you know, how to uh, work with them how to convince them that the product features will come that are not there right now and if there is an issue how do you get that fixed software engineer you will be able to fix it immediately let's say i will go into the code and fix it product managers you cannot do that because you have a cycle right when you release that product uh, <laughs> testing wise and everything so that's a slightly different mindset so you need to start learning that aspect okay um when you try to hire a pm and when you're speaking through resumes how do you evaluate values like listening skill and evaluation of uh, a product design etc how do you choose a candidate as well as like how should a pm's resume be yeah from resume it's going to be very hard right because they will not <laughs> write that box so things that's the first step for us to crack into that pm interview so i think a lot of us have questions in that area so if you are hiring like what Usually, what comes to mind? Yeah. So um, the key thing is um, what I look for is if you are transitioning from a software engineering to product management, uh, then first and foremost is what you have done from a software point of view, right? Uh, definitely, I look for that. Like, you know, what have you done? Uh, what kind of? I won't call product managers completely, you know, leaders within the company, but let's assume that in the place where you are sitting you are the leader for that right because you are the champion and you are trying to uh, let everyone walk behind you the uh, the software developers and qa and everyone so you are a kind of leader right so first and foremost is i would look for that uh, do you have that leadership quality in your software domain to begin with then you will be able to lead the team once you get into the pm role as well that's one thing and second thing is uh, even in the resume right you need to kind of highlight why you will become a good product manager i'm not saying that you need to write like a essay or something right but at least from your summary point of view right in your resume you need to kind of explain why you think or a uh, cover letter whatever that might be right you need to kind of explain why you think you can be a better product manager uh, being a software engineer how can you translate that experience right that means you can in your experience you might have worked with customers or you might have worked with sales department how did you analyze their requirements it can be a couple of examples right it doesn't need to be like a, again big essay uh, you can explain um, how you have translated that into more meaningful uh, requirements or something right and translate that into the code so that's what we are looking for as a product manager apart from a lot of these companies which are looking for if you are applying for a healthcare do you have experience or not i'm not talking about that aspect of it just purely from a product manager point of view okay so 
one more question. Uh, since you work in like companies which are on a different size as you, uh, does the definition of the role of PM differ in startups or big size companies? A big, a lot, <laughs> definitely. Uh, that was actually one of my the, the presentations. Uh, I don't have other slides, but uh, yeah, it differs a lot because in a smaller company, uh, you are wearing a lot of hats. I was wearing a hat every other hour, right? Uh, sometimes I have to wear a hat of customer support because when I joined, there was only one customer support person. So if she gets a call and she doesn't know what to answer or what to say, She'll come and call me, and I have to go and stand there and talk to the customer. Same thing, you know, from a QA point of view. There were days where I was also doing testing. I was not doing coding, but I was also doing testing the day before release. Again, it depends on the customer, company size, and how sophisticated that company is, and also what kind of processes that they have. But companies like Oracle and Workday or any other established companies, right? They have a lot more process in place, right? Um, so uh, the way they follow things and the tools that they have to kind of go through all those things, uh, when do they release the product? In small companies, you release the product the day before, like you know, if you're releasing tomorrow morning, then you'll be developing and testing tonight. Come Big companies, it's not like that, right? Unless again, work day where they are like continuous development. Companies like Oracle, they will develop something now and they'll release a month later. So it's a quite different, right? So as a PM, your role will be slightly different. How you kind of uh, look forward for new features, how you're dealing with QA or development or anyone. So there is a definitely big difference. Uh, another question from the audience is that, uh, is it that product managers are responsible for determining what would be the feature of the product capability in the next two years? Uh, there are some other persons, why is it too Yeah, uh, it is, uh, I would say yes and no. Because at the end of the day, right, uh, product has to be sold. Right? Um, so if you are trying to sell a product where the features are, uh, let's say you are some person, like a salesperson or marketing person, they actually go and say that, okay, we have these features or we need to sell this so the customer will buy next, let's say, quarter, right? I, uh, because they need to fill their quota, right? So if they have to go and sell that, they'll come back and tell you what needs to be developed from a requirements point. This is what they need to satisfy. What is in product manager's hand is how do you design that? How do you satisfy the requirement? But it will not be in product manager's hand 100% what needs to be developed. Because there is a company direction and a company uh, or a sales direction, like, you know, what we need to do. Yes, of course, uh, product manager will also have the flexibility where certain areas they will have 100% control because these are new features that even salespeople do not know, right? Sometimes you have to build something which it's not there in the market. So you need to come out with your own stuff. So it's a mixed bag of things. Yeah, because why I'm asking this question is that one is that it can be reactive to the market or one can be proactive to the market. Like in the case of Sony, they used to say that customers don't know what they want. So we will dictate the market and give you the product so the customer will love it. Right. So in that kind of scenario, is that product manager is the responsible person or there's some other person who also does this kind of thinking and forward thinking and yeah, so uh, again, it depends on uh, how what type of organization it is. At Oracle, product strategy group is that, right? So you can call them as product managers, but they were kind of outbound looking into the industry, construction industry, we were looking at like, a, where is everything going right now? Uh, for example, in construction industry, people are looking for getting some data from drones. That's one example. Flying the drones on the construction site, get, capture all the images, translate that into some kind of a meaningful information. Now, is that a customer looking for that? Maybe not. Uh, so at that point of time, it is a product strategy person kind of thinking about how do I use that to translate that into more meaningful requirements. So at that time, product managers are responsible for that. But again, it depends on how the organization is structured. 
uh, some companies, yeah. A lot more control. Yes. Not not exactly, but I'll give you an example. Uh, I was talking to someone uh, from Google Maps uh, a year back, and there, um, what they were saying was that what we see Google Maps, of course, a lot of features are there, a lot of new features get added, but it is actually a responsibility of the product manager who actually comes up with the features. Right? Again, I would consider the product management for the B2C market is different than the B2B. If it's B2C, then you have a lot more uh, leverage, right? You can actually throw something at it. If it doesn't uh, fit, you can take it back, like Facebook or Google or anyone. Uh, yeah, you have like millions and billions of users. Maybe 10% uh, of them won't use it. For B2B, that's not the case. Your 10% is big, right? You cannot afford that. So again, it depends on the company, how you, what kind of features that you can add as a product manager. Do I have the complete liberty or I'm constrained by the market and my revenue potential and other stuff. But definitely product managers have that flexibility, not that they don't have it, uh, but their innovation and everything comes uh, in, in the form of how do they solve the problem. They can be sol solving the problems in a number of ways. Yeah, solving, getting a requirement, and solving in a creative way with a different skill set, and that might be done in the normal software application development or something like that. But again, determining what would be the product feature, and then that comes upstream of the designing or coming up with a creative solution. Right. But upstream is, I believe, more important. Right. And maybe the project manager transitions into the product strategy pool. And gives that direction. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so if you're coming from, let's say, non-technical background, for example, then in your field, I won't be able to give an example or anything, but in your field, there might be something that you have done from a creative things point of view, right? Whether it might be, uh, I actually, I can give an example. I know someone who I worked with at an Oracle, that person came from technical writing background, right? But they have done a lot of, creative stuff there with respect to how do they develop the content, how do they translate that content to the customers so that they can use that, reuse that, things like that. So if they can kind of project that, then there is a better chance of that, them getting, because at the end of the day, if you take like list of things that you need for a product manager, what I was saying, you know, listening, being creative and other stuff, if you have done that in any of your past career, right? It doesn't matter what it is. If it can translate into that, I don't see any reason why you cannot kind of happen. No, 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 not at all. I have seen people who have moved from, as I said, support organization, customer side. The, I mean, I, I'll just give an example. In construction industry, people have something like uh, uh, project controls. That's just an example, the title I'm giving you. They are the people who actually control the project, like the budget, and they oversee the cost and other aspect of it. They don't have anything, there is no knowledge about product management. They never built any software. But because they have demonstrated that kind of capabilities, they are able to come into the product management group. Hi, I'm Rashmi. I work at Oracle as a software developer. All right. <laughs> so, more family member. Yeah. So, when you transition from a software engineering role to Product manager, uh, was it within the same organization or like was it? Yeah, it was in the same organization. Okay. So, so what were the challenges you saw like, uh, 
what were the skills you felt you missed uh, carrying from a software engineer? Yeah, so um, since it was the same department, it was kind of okay. It was not a uh, big uh, jump for me because I know the uh, people and also I know the market and the product that we were actually building. So it was not a uh, too complex transition for me. So and also convincing people, right? Uh, I can definitely understand if you're trying to go to a different department or different company, it is a challenge. It's not easy. Um, but what helped is again knowing the product right um, but also when i was talking to these people from a transition point of view um, i was able to position myself uh, I, I cannot give like a timeline or anything but i was able to position during the my like the software uh, tenure itself right i was able to kind of position myself saying that uh, I can understand the customer requirements. So I was asking more questions on that side rather than saying that I have this cool feature Let me show it to you. Let me demo how this uh, cool functionality works on using Java I was not doing that. I was kind of going more towards Okay, that requirement. How can I can still solve with software side, but uh, Does this meet your customer need? right uh, What do they expect out of this? Uh, I was working for Oracle shipping and transportation application. So this is way back. Uh, it's all part of supply chain and everything. So one of the example was that uh, if I have, if they have to uh, print some kind of a bill of lading, for example, that's because of the shipping and transportation thing. So I used to talk to the uh, product managers and other people about, okay, what what do they expect customers wise? Software, don't forget, forget about the software. That we can solve. But are they expecting where uh, they are going to give us a layout of the uh, 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 billing information and we need to plug in something? Uh, at what point of are they going to uh, print that document? What else do you need? Do you need a barcode on that? Do you need this information? So it's more like a question and answers kind of thing as a product manager. Like, you know, you are asking the requirements. So that kind of pushed me more into uh, product management side. That's actually triggered more into my brain, like maybe I should talk to customers more. Maybe my, as a person, I can do a better job in that rather than doing software. No offense to software development, but yeah, that's, that's why I transitioned into that. Yeah, hi, this is Samuel. Um, so you mentioned that uh, you leverage agile methodology. Um, so as a product manager, when you were you were leveraging other methodology, did you have distributed teams? Uh, if so, how come uh, you, you uh, what were the challenges and how come you uh, countered them? So distributed, I'm assuming you're talking about all over the world. Maybe across US or maybe across the yeah, world. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, um, Luckily for uh, the Skyr, the company Skyr, we were all in one place. It was literally like a shed, right? So we were all under one shed. So that was not a problem. Uh, Oracle, I did not deal much with uh, agile side of it because I was more onto the product strategy and outbound and other stuff. But then, uh, definitely, I know the challenges. It's not. Uh, it's not that I'm not aware of those challenges. Uh, the challenges would be more from a day-to-day -day, uh, understanding of the requirements to begin with and also day-to-day -day progress right if you are trying to implement agile how do you do that um, I mean there is there is no silver bullet we can say that okay this will solve it it's more to do with um, how you kind of work as you know in the relationship right like you know they are going to talk about requirements let's say you are a product manager you are at one place and the entire development team is somewhere else or they're also distributed then day-to-day -day scrum is of course much important compared to anything else um, but uh, my recommendation would be uh, that you actually go and meet them once in a while every month or so uh, so let's say you there is something called a planning cycle right like you know uh, whether it is a month release and you have a planning period like you know first two three days you have to plan and then you write down all the stories and then you give them all the story points and other stuff that part uh, is key and also you would talk about the requirements part right what is getting developed uh, for that next let's say couple of sprints 
that has to be a face to face interaction because there is nothing to beat that of course it's not possible in all cases but if it is possible that would be my recommendation because that establishes your relationship with them uh and one of the key thing is that developers and qa they should feel that you as a product manager you know what you are talking about right because they are trusting your judgment with respect to any feature that is getting added if they don't have that trust then forget about any other methodology nothing will work uh you will be i mean they will develop something which you will be rewriting every single release you don't want to be in that situation so you need to know that and the only way you can communicate that is having that face to face conversation and showing that confidence that i know what i'm talking about right uh, it can happen on the phone but cannot happen also if that is not possible at least try to go every two months or so so that they know that you know your stuff right and especially last thing on the agile stuff i'll stress is that um you been because agile is pretty fast right it's not like you know uh, you can wait for 6 months so as i said you need to show that you know the product you know the market so it's almost like going and selling to a customer right you're selling the requirements to the development team because they are working next 2 weeks or 4 weeks to develop that day in day out so you need to have all your information ready which includes which market which customer if possible uh what kind of stories that you can tell them uh, with respect to that requirement you should be a very good storyteller like i'm not talking about you know faking it or anything but sometimes you have to you have no choice because you need to make them believe that you know that because the, only then they'll trust you right because it is a fast paced one right uh so you, you need to be more uh good at that like you know, selling them the idea okay Every company has their own definition of it, but uh, at least I'll give you my definition. What I have seen from my experience. So uh, every company has this different uh, titles. I've seen even at Oracle, uh, just because uh, some companies had this title before they got acquired by Oracle, they kind of carried forward, right? The same title, like business analyst, for a long time, and then they change it to functional designers. Then they finally change it to product manager. Uh, so it's like same title there's, there's no or rather same fun, uh, job that they do it's just that because of their background and where they're coming from they have changed um, in silicon valley we call them all product managers there is no it is as far as my knowledge goes there is no functional designer or a uh, business analyst in my opinion business analysts are people who are actually more on to the at least my experience is that they are trying to uh um, kind of bridge some gap between development and product management not 100% they are like somewhere in the middle but product manager in my opinion are people who are really working out with the customers sales department your marketing department qa and development you are like sitting in the center if you're not doing any of that stuff right all together then you're not a product manager you are something else some other def- definition of that because at the end of the day as a product manager you need to know when the uh, development is going to be done like you know you need to pass on your requirements to them right qa you need to understand like they you need to explain them what should be tested not a developer as a uh, end user you are wearing that end user hat you are going to tell them what needs to be tested as a sales uh, going to a sales person you are telling them these are the features that are coming out as a marketing person you are telling them that hey you know what this is the functionality that is coming out how do you want to market it how do we you know you give me the market analysis and other stuff right so that i can design my product well so essentially you are working with all of them right as a product manager you are sitting right in the middle 
from a um, uh, the roles point of view, you are as a product manager uh, over a period of time it has changed. So before product managers used to do also the design of the UI and other stuff, while a lot of them used to suck, which includes me. I used, uh, we used to design all these pages and I mean I was not an artist. So for me, I used to take the UI that is already there into uh, the UI tools and you know change the text here and there and give it to the development team. But that's not a true UX, right? You want so we have now UX team. So it's almost like some part of product management kind of got cut off and given it to the UX people. So I would think them they are like, you know, your logical extinction. They are your buddies, your close buddies. If you don't have them, your half of your half part, you know, body parts are gone because you cannot design in this day and age a product without having a good experience. Unless it is a product which no one, you know, it's not a web product or a mobile product, right? So uh, UX and UI is key. So you are not playing that role as a product manager, but you are working with them. But if the company is too small, then you have to wear that hat as well, right? But as a product manager, you are kind of gathering the requirements. You are laying down the foundation of uh, those requirements in chunks, when those things need to be delivered. You are not necessarily architecting the entire system because uh, if it is a SaaS product or something, for example, then you have uh, people who are actually doing that from a overall technology point of view, how things are connected. What you are doing is how does the functional aspect of it works, right? Again, depends on the product, what kind of product you're building. If it is a B2B web-based application, of course, you are talking about what kind of functions that should be there. Let's say it's a billing application. How would people experience that billing experience coming to the, your website? Uh, and if it is a mobile application, what kind of things that they need to see from your mobile application point of view. Designer is different. You are talking about, okay, on first page, what kind of things that they would do, right? Then I go to the next page and do something else. So all that stuff, you are actually designing that. You are kind of imagining that as a user, you are talking to them, you are taking that requirement and you are translating that into these multiple pages conceptually. Then you are working with the UX person to say, now give me screens which will fit into this uh, context, right? So because that's what your job is. And validating that, yes, that will work. Because your UX person is not going to go to the developer and say that build this. You are validating that because you are wearing that hat as an end user. UX person doesn't know how certain things work in the industry. That, that's not their job. Their job is to tell you how uh, things should be laid out. Developer is going to tell you how the code will be done, right? But you are kind of gluing it together. So that's kind of long version of product manager's definition. Also, you mentioned that uh, you know a product manager manages product owners. So, in what way is your role as a product manager different from a product owner? Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> company at Kaya, right? So it was a little weird, but um, because all these product managers were reporting to me, um, I had to play some role, right, across all of them, apart from, you know, talking to salespeople and everyone else. So as a chief product owner, my job was, uh, because we have this big product and each product owner is working in different areas, I had to make sure that I kind of own or oversee all those things because they're all getting connected properly, right? Of course, they're going to talk to each other, but my responsibility was ultimately from a customer point of view, um, are we delivering whatever we have promised, right? So that was the chief product owner role that I was playing. Of course, I grew into that. It's not that day one I was like that. When I joined, I was a product manager. And then as and when we built the team, we had more people, we had to have someone who's actually talking to the sales department or marketing or someone else, right? So that was my responsibility. So that is more like a chief product owner role. You don't see that in a lot of companies. It's not a common role, but you also see some areas where they will call it, uh, call them as um, uh, chief product. Yeah, they would call them chief product owners, but it's more like, you know, they will be like a, uh, how do I say it? 
not a VP of product management, but a little lower than that. You are more like, you know, uh, you are not worried about like, you know, uh, any budgeting or anything like that. Your job is purely from a product point of view. All that other stuff would be taken care of by your VP of products and other stuff. So think from that angle. So that was my role. Hi. Uh, speaking of UX, uh, what are your expectations of the UX team and uh, how do you describe the main lab? What should it be in the ideal situation? The ideal situation is that, um, again, you have different UX is a much bigger thing now, right? You know, you have a lot of things, interactive designers and uh, people who actually uh, uh, do the wireframes and other stuff. So there are a lot of things that have been evolved, uh, but I'll lump everything together because for me, they're all together. It's some companies try to separate them out just because they have a lot of people that, you know, they can hire. But for me, UX is one single unit, right? UX is a logical extension to product management because at the end of the day, how you kind of um, deliver that product to the customer and they are experiencing what you have designed from a UI point of view, right? Whether it can be something in your car, like where there's like you know, all the Android and you know, Apple Play and other stuff, take it all the way to the mobile applications or even, you know, B2B web applications, right? everywhere you need to have a UX person who can actually take that vision that is laid out by the product managers and translate that into more meaningful UI with whether it's less number of clicks or intuitive whatever that might be right so the key is to understand who the end user is from the product manager perspective or end users who are going to interact with the system is it one person two people three people 100 people. So that information they should be able to capture from the product manager, translate that into how you lay out that picture like to the, on the UI or mobile or whatever that might be. And then uh, providing that value from the UI, right? Because you don't want your end user to click like 10 buttons and then realize the value of the application. So how do you capture that value from your product managers? Again, what are they trying to do? Right? So all that information has to be translated from the product manager into the UX. And of course, they have other challenge, which is they need to work with the development team about what is possible and what is not. Whatever a UX person can imagine from a UI point of view, it can be, it's like, you know, uh, an artist, right? They can paint whatever they feel like, right? Because they have that imagination. That's when you can become a UX person. But at the same time, there is a limitation from a technology point of view or a framework or whatever they are using from a development point of view. So you need to go back and talk to them about what is possible. Can I do this grid? Can I do some kind of a magic around this grid? Can I have something flying around? So that's all dependent on how, what developers can do. So they have a pretty tough job to kind of manage all those things together, right? Because product manager is imagining something uh, you will come up with something else and finally what is possible is in the hands of the developer. So you, that person has to kind of triangulate them at the same time uh, satisfying what the product manager wants. So that's a pretty tough job in my opinion. Thanks. You mentioned you worked as a product strategist as well. So I want to understand the um, on a day-to-day -day basis, as for your tasks, what is the difference between a product strategist task and a PM job? <laughs> product strategy, I'll be looking into the sky. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, most of the time, that would be your job as well because you need to think about where to take the product, right? So, um, I'll give you an example. At Oracle, as I said, my job was, uh, I, was the, I was responsible for this new platform that was getting developed. Uh, it's called Oracle Prime. Um, but the idea behind that product was that we are trying to combine six different uh, IPs together. So how do we kind of combine them together, right? Which product should come first, right? Which IP should be uh, brought into this new platform? Of course, there is other set of group, uh, group which was working on pure product management. So they will be uh, translating the requirements and, you know, 
um, getting working with the UX team, development, and other stuff, right? So they will be responsible for that. But as a product manager, you as a strategy person, you are talking about um, how do I, uh, what is the value added if I bring in this product, right, to the market? But by the way, because that is going to replace one of your legacy products, customer is already having that legacy product with you. So if you go and show it to the customer, what are they going to say? How are you going to position this product to them so that they don't see that we are trying to kill that pre previous product? So you are thinking about all those things from a strategy point of view and when to release those features as well. So that's kind of a job that you would, at least uh, the experience that I had. But typically product strategy person is, is a logical extension to your product management, right? You are talking about, um, I don't see a big difference between those two. Uh, I would call them as inbound and outbound product managers. If you're an outbound product manager, 100% of the time you are a product strategy person because you are thinking about where the product should go. If you're inbound, you're a product manager. You are dealing with the day-to-day -day operations kind of, product operations. So that's the difference. Uh, a couple of questions. My name is Victor experience, what is the average cycle time you have seen for the new product or the digital product? Uh, the product, settle time means like how, uh, when we release and when the customers pick it up? Well, let us say from getting the requirement, getting, sensing the requirement to delivering the end customer. Uh, that is a, hmm. It depends on the features and depending on, so if, if you are talking about a completely new functionality, sometimes we took almost like a year to actually build that, but we did that in phases. Uh, that's because of commitments and show them that progress, right? Because it is quite possible that we are getting this requirement from one single customer. We know that it is going to be translated to other customers as well, but we have to work with them. So it actually took us one year to actually build that sometimes. Some of them, it was pretty straightforward and we actually launched within a month or so. So it all depends on the features, how complex they are and how big they are, right? Uh, so it can vary, it can vary. Uh, at, at Oracle, uh, the new platform that we're building, one of the product features, it took us almost a year and a half, two years to actually kind of get it to a shape where we can actually go back to the customers and show it to them. So there were like multiple cycles not repetition, but just breaking it down to chunks so that we can see the progress and go back to the customer and show it to them that we are developing it. And by the time they picked up, it took almost like two years or so. so depends. My other question is that we are talking about the product manager, basically we are talking about the out of box, out of box product, like the out from itself that you can take and yeah, off the shelf, yeah. You pick it up and install, yeah. So, how much challenges you are seeing getting back into the customer's hand to service the customer application? Yeah, so, uh, I have dealt with both. Something which was out of the box and something which was highly configurable. We don't call it customization because we don't sit and kind of code that. So, at Sky, the product that we built uh, it's called Unifier. It was all configurable. So it was, our goal was to go and sell it to uh, business people within the market, in the construction industry, not for IT folks, where we give them a, a tool and they can start coding it. That was not the case. So we get, build the configuration. So um, that kind of product, uh, it took us a long time to actually build because we have to think about all combinations to provide from a configuration point of view. Again, at, uh, at Oracle, what we did was we kind of transitioned into off the shelf because you know you should be able to install that and start using that in the next couple of weeks or so. There are challenges with both of them, definitely. Uh, configurable product is a lot more flexible, but after you go and start implementing it, you will see a lot of other issues from that, right? Along with the configurable product, I'm also talking about the in-house developed product by the customer. Why do you have the compelling reason to use your product? That kind of challenge. So you're talking more from like, uh, why would a customer pick 
our product compared to what they already have it? To some extent, if that kind of challenges the product manager is having on that. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that depends on if you are a product manager and you are getting into a situation where you are part of the sales group and you are trying to uh, go and sell the product, right? Uh, definitely that question will come up. Like, you know, one of our biggest competitors was Excel. Every customer uses Excel, Microsoft Excel, because that's easy to use and people run billions of dollars of projects on that. And the first question was, how can you do better than Excel, right? So that kind of question definitely will come and if you are part of that group, which is actually kind of, kind of giving the demo, that would be the case for a smaller companies because you will definitely be part of that then you have to have that justification why so you have to have that uh, knowledge why your product can do a better job than theirs so typically that information you would get it from your salesperson so before you're going there or you're building it there you would talk to them they already have a product uh, why are they trying to get a new product why are you actually going and trying to sell if you gather that information you'll be able to put that in the right context as a product manager and kind of give you some kind of a comparison why they should buy your product versus using theirs. So that's definitely big. Irrespective of that, even selling or not, as a product manager, you need to know uh, why are you building your product? How, how are you different from any other products in the market, right? If I'm building a product right now, there are definitely there are three or four companies that are already thinking about it or they already have a product. But you need to be able to realize what is the value that you are bringing. I'm not uh, sure if this question has been addressed before, but uh, could you walk us through uh, the differences associated with the role of a product manager from the industry perspective? In the sense of how would a PM associated with a B2B or a SaaS company stack up against someone who's from B2C? Uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, B2C, uh, my entire career I have been in B2B. Will I be always in B2B? Maybe. I will now, I don't think I'll ever go to B2C. Maybe. Uh, but, uh, I don't know. Uh, but the reason why I'm saying is that I cannot comment a lot on B2C, but based on my knowledge and what I've read and what I've experienced talking to other product managers, I'll just give based on that experience. Okay. Uh, in my opinion, B2B and B2C, uh, definitely you have challenges. It's not uh, challenges are different, completely different. Um, B2C, if you talk about it, you are talking about building a product uh, which is being used by, you don't know how many people are going to use, a lot of people, right? Take Facebook or any feature in, or, uh, in Google or any other thing, right? You know, you are trying to build, even if you, I have uh, I've talked to people who work for Disney uh, who are in but like, no, they are product managers, but they actually build websites and other stuff, like, you know, Disney, some of the digital products. When I say digital products, their whole concept of how they push information to the consumers. They're also called product managers because they need to package all that stuff together. Um, so their challenges are more to do with, like, how do they get the content to the uh, end customer? Um but at the same time, it has to be a lot more generic, right? It, it cannot be like uh, based on any boundaries. So they got to think about what makes sense for the masses, right? They cannot just throw out certain things. They have to go through some kind of a testing process. But at the same time, they have the luxury to actually get that feedback from thousands of people. Right? For example, uh, when we uh, play with Google products, for example, not everyone will get the same map feature uh, at the same time. They will target maybe like 1,000 people or 2,000 or 3,000 people. They will capture that information. That's called A-B testing, right? So they will take that information. They'll have some code separated out so that only certain people are testing and they'll try to track whether they are able to get uh, enough feedback and say whether this feature makes sense or not. They have that luxury. B2B is completely different ballgame. You make a mistake, then you are crucified for that. Because uh, B2B, the market is wide, it's big, there's a lot of money, but at the same time, the number of people who are using is small, right? Um, when we sell our product uh, in a company, 
probably it might range from 10 people using it versus you know, maybe 500 or 1000 people. That's it. You will not have more than that unless you are in a uh, B2B uh, product that you are building and the company wide there is a mandate and this company is let's say a uh, big company like 50,000 people and they all have to use this uh, product then that's a different story but if B2B typically you will have like 500 or 1000 people using it at least the applications that I've built then the feature sets that you are building are pretty specific requirements are very specific because when you are trying to give that product to them these people have used or not used but they have worked in that industry that domain for years 15 20 30 years so their expectation is certain way right i have to deal with these things in certain way right so if you give them a product which yes solves that but you do it in some other way they will not accept that Right? You need to take them the way where you have to consider what they have done before. So for example, the product at Sky, right? what we have built, it actually looks and feels like your Windows layout. Of course, it's a web application. A lot of screens looks like Excel. And because a lot of people who have, uh, from that industry, they have used Excel for a long time. So if I do something else, they're like, I don't know how to click this button. I'm not going to do it. And there, I've seen people who are doing that, right? And if I have provided like a couple of features, cool features, but if it is extra click, I get an email saying that I have to do this 10 times in a day. So you're asking me to do 10 into every week, into every month, into every year. You want me to click that many times? They really sent that email. You want me to click that many times? And there was an enhancement saying that reduce number of clicks. So you will see a completely different set of problems in that. I'm not saying that problems are not there in either one of them, but problems are different. Right? And how you deal with that is completely different as a product manager. You, you've got to have a different mindset at both places. Yes, you can design and everything, but how you kind of design, how you bring, the, bring out the features is completely different. Yeah, one of the things that I was always uh, thinking of alliance of is uh, when you talk about a B2B company, the way uh, you like metrics is an important factor for a product manager. Like a person who is in like into product management has to be very excited about numbers and like, how uh, their product is affecting his customers, his or her customers. So you have very uh, developed systems of telemetry or the sales channels uh, which are in place deep rooted in a B2B. Uh, in the B2B space. However, as opposed to B2C, where you, judging by the number of times your app has been downloaded, you cannot really make out uh, what the metrics are. Right? So, like. Yes, and I would say yes and no because um, again, B2B, B2C, right, depends on what kind of application. If you're saying I'm downloading something, right, again, depends on what kind of product that you are trying to build. Uh, so let's say uh, you're building Microsoft Excel, for example, right? Someone would download and use that. That is still a B2C product. Uh, but can you embed something into that where uh, you will get some metrics? Probably, of course, it depends on the cu uh, customer. If they accept saying that I want to send the metrics back. But if it is an online product, now if you go to Microsoft, I'm sure they're collecting zillion things. When you go to Microsoft 365 and you know, click Excel thing, they'll collect all kind of things, what you're clicking, how you're clicking. So that information can be easily captured from an online B2C application. B2B, yes, your metrics is slightly different. Uh, and at the same time, you don't need that much, that many metrics to figure out uh, whether your application, your feature is being used or not. They'll get back to you. You don't have to find out. They'll call you. They'll say, this suck or this is awesome. So that is... Uh, B2B, that is the advantage of that. You will get an immediate response. Yes, you can embed some kind of a intelligence into that. Saying that, okay, is this a person struggling to figure out something on the product? Uh, because there were cases where we actually hired some, uh, not hired, but we invited some customers and we let them through one of our features, click through that, gave them a script, and they were clicking through that, they were complaining about it, they were happy about it. So you can do that, absolutely. But you would not embed so many things into the product that you want to get a lot of metrics. Again, depends on the product. 
the part that I have dealt with, we just included a few things so that we get some information, but not a whole lot. B2C, absolutely. I mean, sky's the limit, right? You can put whatever you want in that.